All right, amen. Little drum roll. <laughs> hey, we're going to begin uh, our study tonight on the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, just uh, basic Bible 101. It's been my experience through the years of training young pastors and, and teachers that that one of the things that people uh, are most shy about is their knowledge of the Word of God and how to handle the Word of God. And it's all, oh, I can't teach. I, I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to do. And so, uh, a lot of times it's good to go back and and uh, do the, uh, uh, get familiar with the fundamentals of the book and how to use it. And I'm going to show you some tools that I began to use when I first surrendered to preach. Uh, 35 plus years ago and uh, back then we wrote everything out. Uh, I remember the first time I went up into the pulpit I had 11 pages of written notes and preached for an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, the church called the old preacher that had, had lined me up with that gig and said don't ever send that boy back this way again. Amen. There's one guy said, look, there wouldn't be about 11 of us here tonight to let down the whole load. Amen. And so, but you know, learning how to use the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he hath not be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. Our only tool is the Bible. He says a workman. Now those of you that know about skilled workmen, it's a journey. It's a person who knows how to rightly divide the words of truth. The Word of God fits together just like that. And you've got to be able, though, to make application into people's lives. So you have to be able to pull some Scriptures over here and some Scriptures over here. And you can't pull it apart because it's got to fit together. It always fits. And that's one thing I... I by the way, Rob Gardner sent me a, uh, he posted something on uh, Facebook today, and it was in some foreign language. Y'all remember Rob, huh? He preached for us. And I asked him, I said, uh, are you going to a Pentecostal church now? <laughs> uh, you know, and just to, but we've got to study the Word of God, and you're going to discover that no matter what doctrine that you believe, it always fits with every other doctrine. If it doesn't, then it's false doctrine. We have a lot of that out there, such as, uh, and just to give the illustration of that is, is that uh, uh, my mother's people are from Kentucky, and they have a lot of snake handlers up there in that part of the woods. And, uh, uh, and you know, they pull that scripture out of there, which says that they shall take up serpents and they will not harm them, and we're Paul. And they build a doctrine on that. And, and they build their whole life around that. And yet, it doesn't fit with the rest of the Word of God. Everything that you're going to believe is always going to fit together regardless. Now, I want to kind of give you an idea of where we're going to go with this lesson here, these, these uh, studies that we have. And uh, we're going to begin with the table of contents. So you see that in, in your book. Uh, and I'm going to do the introduction part of it tonight. And Brother Robert, you want to come up for just a moment and share with us what in lesson two, what you've got, got on your mind and... And, 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 and Brother Joey, you're going to come up and just as when he's finished and do number three. And that'll kind of give you an idea of how these things are going to fall out in the days ahead. As you can see there, we're going to deal with how to know the Bible. And that means able to have a hands-on. You know, a lot of people don't even know how to use their Bible. They're not sure how the books fit together. But I'm going to show you in this next lesson how they do fit together. And then Robert's going to come in and come on up here, brother. And, and begin to show you that. And then, then we're going to begin to take the characters of the Bible and show you how they fit in the Word and in your life. I think that may be on, brother. Go ahead and kind of give us an idea of what, what we can expect of that. Check, check. Can okay, everybody hear me okay? Still recovering from my son and stuff. Um, when we get to lesson two, um, we're going to look at there's there's five ways to kind of get to know your Bible. And, and we all know them. They're meditate, memorize, and study, and read, and hear. But what I want to do is take those five things and kind of give you a breakdown, kind of explain how do you meditate. Like, what are some ways, what are some effective ways to meditate on the Word? And exactly what that means, and where, where, where God tells us, you know, how to do these things and what these things mean. We all know... We all know what memorized scripture is, but in the same taste of, of meditation, we're also going to look at 
what are some ways to do this? Where should I begin? Where, do, where does all this start? What, is, what does all this mean? Um, and then study. How to study God's Word. How to do that effectively. And try to give you some techniques. Try to give you some information. Try to give you some things that have helped me in my journey. Some things that I've learned. That, that, have, helped, that have helped me with effective ways of studying God's Word. And maybe give you some ideas and some things that... Well, I study now, but it just seems to be... Brother Robert, where it's become repetitive. And I, I just... I'm going to give you a fresh concept. I'm going to try to give you some fresh information on that. And then reading God's Word. <clears throat> we'll do the same thing with that as well as hearing the Word of God. But, but my, my, my idea of teaching, I try to break things all the way down. Some of this stuff you may have already heard. Some of these things may be kind of a refreshment to you. But what I want to do is give you some things that I've been taught, some things that I've learned through schoolings and things that may ring a bell with you and, and try to give you some, some different things with those five things. Meditation, reading the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God. Try to give you some, some new looks at that um, and give you some techniques that you can use in your own study time um, that, may, that may ring a bell with the Word of God. But we're going to try. My, my goal is during my time with you um, as we look at, at, at number two is and we may not finish it in a Sunday. It may take a while to go through this. Those five techniques are very deep. Uh, one of the things we kind of agreed on is we're not going to put a timetable on these things, and we're going to try to, to give you enough time to dissect everything. So we may only make it through two techniques. We may make it through three. We may only make it through one. But um, the, the idea is to give you some fresh things about the Word of God, give you some things, some things that you may have not thought about, give you some techniques and things that, that help you with your daily study, that will help you with your daily relationship. Because when it's all said and done, it's all about our relationship with Jesus. That's what we're, that's what we're after, trying to give you a better understanding of that and give you some things that you can use during your own time. <clears throat> What Dr. Wallace is going to teach you next week, and what Robert's going to teach you, dig deep. Dig deep. Because what comes after that is when we get into the characteristics of God. That's what lesson three is going to be. Characteristics and attributes of God. When I started studying this, my first initial was to use my Bible, New Living Translation. But I started thinking, there's different translations. And we're going to talk about these translations in the next couple of weeks. This is the newest version translation of the Bible. Easy to understand. But what's in there sometimes is King James Version puts it in a different perspective. My suggestion is get you two or three different translations of the Bible. Most of them probably have them. I got three or four or five at home. I got a New American Standard right here with me in the New Testament. But whenever it asks you to look for a Bible verse, and you read that Bible verse, it might not ring true with one translation, but the next translation might hit a, a nerve on you to make you understand it. Because let me tell you, these Bible studies are going to get in depth. I told Dr. Wallace this morning, when we started, still, I started this out, it asked you to look up these Bible verses. Didn't meditate on them. Just like Robert's going to teach you. Study them. And then you have to write your own explanation of how this attribute, this characteristic, puts it in your perspective. How do I relate this to me from God? It's going to be very detailed. Like Robert said, you know, I'm used to teaching children. If it's hard for me to understand, I'm sure it's hard for some other people to understand. So I like to kind of dummy it down a little bit. I want to try to get it on the basic level. Because I tell you what, Sometimes I think we get too theological explanations sometimes. If you think about what did Paul use when he was out there ministering to people? What did Peter use? Just the basic words of Jesus Christ. But we need to know who God is. Who is Jesus? 
How can we explain that to people? More importantly, how can we show that to people? It's going to be a tremendous study that we're going to have here. Get involved in the Bible. Be reading your Bible. That's why I tell the children, read your Bible. Back in August, we started working with children with the books of the Bible. And that's what one of the lessons I think Dr. Wallace is going to have it next week too is learning the books of the Bible. Why do you need to learn the books of the Bible? One of the Bibles, the Bible I used to study is in chronological order. But yet, if you tell me a story, I'm having to think with that one, where is that story at in time? To re- go back into that area, to find out what book is in it. That's knowing your Bible. That's knowing the characteristics of God. Because what God did in Genesis, He repeats it. And repeats it. God's mercy in Genesis is His mercy in Matthew, is His mercy in Revelation, His mercy today. I challenge you to get into your Bible. As we start studying this stuff, it will all come so much easier, so much Open your mind up a whole lot more. So I challenge you. Don't drop out. Invite your friends. We'll try to have it on the internet too. But study. Pray. Memorize. That's the only way you get to draw close to God. Hey Amen. Just just a few uh, ground rules. I always like to set this when, I, when I'm teaching in college. is. uh a little bit different here. You feel free. I, I want you to be at home here. I don't want this to be a burden to you. Get up and get some coffee when you want it, something to drink. And, and if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll get to you as long as you don't take us down a rabbit hole. Amen? And keep us there too long. We, we, we're going to be sort of sort of moving on. And, uh, just to kind of give you always like to go through the syllabus, uh, the purpose of the class and... Uh, uh, what we're, we're going to try to learn here. Generally, this class is taught as a new member's orientation. And the first thing we generally do is welcome the new, all new believers into the family of God and, and, and say that we all have a new nature. And that new nature is Christ-like. And, and uh, one of the reasons I wanted us to go through this orientation was is I'd like to see this become a part of our Sunday school in the days ahead to where every new member goes through this same orientation to where we're all believing the same, that we're all have our Baptist beliefs together we, and alike instead of having variations of what we believe. Uh, Paul wrote, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are... For you all make a request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. The key is, is that God is always working on you. I don't know if you remember that old song the kids used to sing, uh, He's still working on me. You remember that? I, I think that makes great application even to adults today. Uh, all right. <laughs> Our intent of this course of study is a study of biblical doctrine to be a basis for spiritual growth and development. All biblical doctrine, in essence, is to grow you spiritually. I said it this morning, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The more I have my hands on the Bible, the greater the depth of my spiritual being. This is the manna from heaven that as I allow it to penetrate and permeate my mind and my thoughts and my actions, I began to take on a spiritual being type person that is a lot like Christ. And that growth continues until the day of Christ Jesus. And it begins with a journey leading until Christ begins to be perfect in us. Uh, always begin your study with a prayer for guidance and, and protection of the Word because I 
might have shared this with you once before. I had a couple of young preachers in a class I had taught years ago, and, and one of them got caught up in spiritual warfare. And he was reading everything he could get his hands on about the devil and all of those things. And, and I told him, I said, you know, you need to... All things in moderation, the Bible says. And if you spend all of your time concentrating on the devil, guess what? You're going to begin to lean that way. That's going to begin to uh, work on your mind and your conscience. I said, you need to spend at least three hours in fellowship with Christ for every hour you're out there doing that type of thing. And here it is, he says to us, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. And as you look in your, your syllabus as you're coming on through there, you're going to come to a page that says personal testimonies. And there's a testimony outline in, in the book there. It, it's the last page just before the introduction. And uh, it has several things. It has a, a brief testimony. What is a testimony? You remember when Jesus cast the devil out of the demoniac and he wanted to get on board with him and he said, no, go and tell. You go home and you tell what great things God has done for you. Every Christian ought to have a simple, brief testimony. It's called the elevator uh, testimony. There's something that you can share with people in 30 seconds or less. And we're going to get into that as the days go on and, and we begin to uh, uh, look over that part on evangelism. And we're going to expand on that and begin to have the major details of what God has done in your life. Now, Joey mentioned Bible versions. Did you know I, I'm... Uh, I'm just King James. That's all I can tell you. I was born and bred in that, and I'm, I'm going to die in that. And, and uh, here's some other ones that you might: the New King James, uh, the Contemporary English Version, the New Living Translation. Uh, there's some paraphrases out there that I I, I sort of like the message and the and the Living Bible. But but the key is is just read the Bible. Now, one of the things that we're going to do in this course is is all of our teaching is going to come from the Word of God, but this is going to be our textbook, and you'll be expected to know it at the end of 12 weeks. Uh, <laughs> this thing cost about 50 bucks, but this is the, the text that they used to use in Introduction to Theology in the Seminary in New Orleans. I, I don't know what they use now, but this is probably the best book. It's called Christian Theology, 2nd edition by Miller J. Erickson. And, and I want to tell you, it's some powerful, powerful stuff. So if you'd like to follow along with how we're going to develop the doctrine over these next couple of months, the next, you might want to just, that might be something you want to give yourself for a post Christmas present. And uh, I guarantee you that uh, you will uh, you will enjoy reading it. it it's, uh, in fact, if you do much preaching and teaching, it is almost already laid out in some areas for that. And one of the things that it really majors on is Scriptures themselves. I, I think it's just a tremendous work there. And you're free to come take a look at it after, after class there. And, but the key is, as Joey said, read the Bible. Get in the habit of reading the Bible on a daily basis. Whether it's one minute or two minutes or five minutes or, or that. We have the open windows up there and I know a lot of you use the open windows. I can't think of anything better to have a daily devotion than read through the Bible than open windows. If, if we're going to change the world, it's going to be because we know the Christ of this book. And you can't know Him apart from Scripture. You just can't. There, nowhere in the Bible does it ever give light that you can know Jesus apart from Scripture. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hear something about Christ to be saved. You can't just somebody come and say, do you know Jesus? Oh, what, uh, would you like to be saved? Well, pray this prayer. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can't, unless there's some kind of faith that has been moved in your life, you can't. So that's why we... We study the Word of God. In fact, I, I want to share with you here uh, four important verses that we want to remember. The first is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The key to the verse is whosoever. God says that whoever believes can be saved. 
Whoever believes in the Son, the only begotten Son. And that old verse is packed. I think that uh, uh, R.G. Lee, who was the great preacher at Bellevue uh, that from years ago, in fact, you might have heard his sermon, great sermon that he, he preached world renowned. Payday someday. Anybody ever heard that? We need to just play that one day on a Sunday morning. Let me have a break and listen to that. I mean, that's a great sermon. You need to look it up and listen to it. But he preached out of John 3.16, I want to say over 15 times when he was at Bellevue. He said it was a scripture that you can never... Adrian Rogers preached it 11 times while he was there. 26 times that they preached out of this one verse at the same church. It's inexhaustible. The Word of God. John 3, 16. Uh, Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can remove me from my salvation. Absolutely nothing. If what I have is real... Man, I'm going to tell you, God's there. He's in the Word. And right here, nothing can separate me from that point or that time. Uh, the next one, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. This is how we, we know that we're saved. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised thee from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If we believe, we'll be saved. And then the last one there, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Trust God. I think two things I want to tell you as you read the Bible. First of all, I always pray before I read. I never pray until I read. And I do two things in my prayer. First of all, I confess my sins. You can't hear from God if sin is blocking. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He said that his ear is not uh, deaf that he cannot hear, but your sins have separate. You can't hear from God if there's unconfessed sin in your life. So I like to get that out of there. And the second thing is, is I ask God to open up the Word to me. Speak to me. And I've never been let down. The few times that I didn't get anything from God is because I didn't get the unconfessed sin out of my life. And so He didn't speak. Trust God. I'm going to tell you, God has a word for you. Now, I, I don't know how your uh, teaching is or how your study of the Bible. Robert's going to deal with that when we get to that, how to study the Bible and get the most out of your study in, in time like that. But but uh, I, I, when I when I study the Word of God, I, I expect to hear from God. And I've seen some times where God has given me a word. Like right now, I'm going through the book of Job and... And, and uh, you know, just a little uh, biblical precedence here. A lot of people believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Now, personally, I have some doubt about that. I, as I read it through there and, and what Job is saying and what they're saying and what they're talking about, I, I really don't believe that Job, I, I don't know, I can't prove it. I, I'm not an archaeologist or anything like that or whatever those folks are that do with that. But, but you know, as you read... God speaks to you and He shows you some things. Not only did I see some things in there about Job that, that made me to question my belief about it being the oldest book, but I saw some things in there that dealt with uh, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Is there a gap? Is there something in there? And some of the things that Job says and his friends are talking about, which they're talking about things that are happening right there in their life right then, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I, I said, I need to take a fresh look at that. I need to read back through Job, take my notebook, and, and make a couple of lists there, and begin to list these verses, and then check them out and see what other folks are saying about that. And so, that's the way it is with, with the study of the Bible. Man, it just, it, it's always speaking. And there's another thing that I've noticed as I study the Word of God. Now, I, I keep a... Uh, a sort of a journal like of, uh, and in my Bible I, I'm forever marking up a Bible and, and writing in the margin and stuff like that but God will speak to my heart about a word and I'll write that down and I'll even take highlighters I keep highlight, I got a whole pile of highlighters on my desk over here at the desk at the house and by my chair where I do most of my study uh, Mel says I'm sleeping but actually I'm studying just got my eyes closed. Amen. I can't wait. All right, you look too serious out there. All right, hey. And, and, and I will, I like to keep at least three different colors. 
And as God shows it, He opens up the passage to me. I highlight them in different areas. And right there begins a lesson that could be taught a sermon. And so I said, well, Lord, is this what you want to preach Sunday? And He says, no, not now. But I have it there. And, and a couple of months later, something happens in my life and bam, I, I remember that passage and I go back to it. And it's already highlighted. It's already marked out and there it is. And I said, oh, the sermon's all here. Now all i got to do is do the word studies and, and, and make the application. And, and you see, that's what happens when you study the Word of God. God speaks to you. So the nature of this new believers class, well, not new believers, but but uh, uh, began to deal, you know, you've made a decision for Christ to be your Savior and Lord. And I'm going to teach you just like it. You, you guys just got saved. Amen? Because I think we need to go back and, and start something. Now we got this new nature and this old nature that are battling away in us. And, and, and we need to, to do something with it. And that's what we're going to do. You're going to see these three issues begin to, they kind of pop up all through these lessons. About now that you're saved, here's how you deal with Jesus. Here's how you deal with the Father. Here's how you deal with the Holy Ghost. Here's what you do with prayer. And, and so you, this new decision that you make and how it affects you mentally and spiritually and physically. And so it, it begins to develop that in And then one of the major things we'll do is spend quite time with God. Uh, you know, as I was putting this PowerPoint together, that keep a Bible paper pen in just jumped in there and I could not get it out of it. It just jumped out there first. I said, Lord, do you want that first? But the first thing is, as we began this study, and you want to get the most out of it, because I'm going to tell you, as I mentioned this morning and mentioned last week, time is valuable. You know, those of you that are 50 and older, you, time really has become valuable. Amen? And, and so, make the best use of your time. And the best use is going to be with God. You can't spend any better time than with God. So set a specific time and a place and don't let anybody take that from you. Because I'm going to tell you, this goes back to uh, uh, the slide before. Let me get back here if I can. Well, I can't get back to it. But anyway, and it talked about the old nature and the new nature. Alright? They're going to be battling. And the old nature is going to say, oh man, you get that. you get it tomorrow. You'll catch up tomorrow. But you know what? You never catch up on time that's lost. Once the clock winds, it never comes back. You don't know what God might have said to you and what He might have done. Oh, you're done. No, that's not how God works. So you, you set that time. Uh, one of the uh, uh, dis disciplines that I learned as a writer is, is to write at the same time every day for the same length of time. Now, I learned this from preparing sermons over the years. I have certain times during the week that that's all I'm going to do unless there's an emergency in the church. I'm going to be in front of my computer with these books and with God and I'm going to be working. And I've discovered that my mind already knows that and it has made the leap into that conscious state where I want... Bev, you can ask Bev. She'll come in and say, and I'm just a type of man. My fingers are on fire. I, God's speaking and I'm moving. That's just the way... It, and that's the same way with you. You've got to have that specific time and I'm going to tell you, your spirit will begin to crave the presence of the Lord. It really will. And it just it began to expect that time together. And there may be times when you go in there and you're so exhausted from the day before and the night, you didn't get it, you were sick and you were ready. But just being there is going to be so tranquil and peaceful, even though you don't... I uh, had a friend of mine that was in the hospital over the Christmas holidays for four hours, I mean four days. And I asked her, I said, why don't you call me? I'll come pray she said, have you ever been in that place to where you couldn't do anything? And believe it or not, I've been there. Amen. I know what that was like. And she said, all I could do was trust God. And I'm going to tell you, that's why you have this specific time in place. Is even when in your conscious mind and your body is worn totally out and your mind is exhausted, you just know, if I can get to that place with God, God's going to be there. And whether I say a word or read a word, I know I'm going to be in the presence of God. And I'm going to tell you, it's the most powerful time. And the more you do it, the stronger it gets. And you don't ever want to leave home without it. The second thing is, is be consistent and develop a routine or a schedule. I, I say, you know, 
in that I like to pray through the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, difference against such a... I like to go through them and ask God to help develop them in my life. I also like to go through the spiritual armor of God, the help of salvation, the breastplate of righteous loins of, of the truth, and, and, and feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the shield of faith. Every sermon I've preached in this church has been bathed in prayer and in the Word of God. It's, it's, it's what I do. I, I, until God speaks to me and then I read it over and over and over again until it saturates my soul. And, and so develop a consistent uh, routine or schedule and then learn to keep a Bible and, and paper and a pen handy. I can't tell you, I, I, I like those dental pegs. They just kind of fit with a Bible. I've got, I don't know how many of them. I've got maybe 25 or 30 of them just filled with thoughts and ideals that God has spoke to me over the years. And then begin with prayer and thanksgiving always with your time with God. And then, last of all, if it's on here, end with a def definite project for the day. God, what is it that you want me to do? What is it, God, that... And, and get something from God. Get a word from the Lord. Alright, let's move on to the Bible. God's holy word. Alright, I want anybody want to lead us in this? Y'all know that something? I tried to, I had it somewhere, and, and, and I've been looking for it for a week uh, from one of our Bible schools up. The kids are doing the assault commencement night, but I never could find it. I was going to download and do that. But it's all about the Bible. And yeah, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Here comes your first homework for the class. Memorize 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for reproof, for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Believe it or not, I thought I used to know that. Amen? Uh, we also have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in the dark places until the dawn, day dawn and the day star rise in your heart, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now I want to begin to stop there and begin to help you see why it's important that you study the Word of God. Now, in this book here, uh, we're going to talk about how the Bible comes. How did we get the Bible that we have today? Uh, is the book inspired? How do we know that it's inspired? Well, we just read that all Scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine and proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly uh, furnished unto all good works. And, and then we hear knowing this verse that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are three main beliefs on how we got the Bible. There's actually about seven altogether, but almost all everybody falls. We'll not get into those. The only, the only thing that matters is probably the three uh, most popular. Uh, the first one is, is the Southern Baptist belief, which is, is that God spake to these men and they wrote down exactly what God wanted them to write down and they used, God used their minds and their words and they wrote that down perfectly what God wanted to be. The other one is, the second one is, and it's popular in, in, in a lot of circles, uh, more of your uh, uh, progressive denominations, is that God spoke to these men and these men went and sat down and they said, well, you know, this is what God said. And they wrote it out as they saw fit. And, and that's why some people believe that there could be some human error in the Scriptures. Now, the third one is called the dictation theory. And what it is, it's a lot like what the Baptist, and when I say Southern Baptist, I mean Baptist faith and message. And it's the one point where I disagree with Southern Baptists. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I do not accept that ideal. I don't believe that is how. And I, this is my text here. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake 
as they were moved by the Holy Ghost of God. Now that same theological concept is revealed in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 2. And, and, and we find the Holy Spirit there moving in creation. And He says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. And, and what that means was He literally came and hovered over them. And I like what it was with Peter. And here's another one is, and why I, I believe in the dictation theory is, I believe the Holy Ghost possessed them and took them and they wrote exactly, it was almost dictation. They were writing exactly word for word as God said it. Because... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture, that's past, totally inclusive. Every word of the Bible is the Word of God. And it's absolutely, Jesus said, not one jot or tittle shall pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Now that's one man's belief. That's, and that's what I happen to believe. I believe that as he moved in, he moved it on in. And like Peter, when it was that uh, he was up on the roof and, and God came and spoke to him and he showed him all these unclean animals and he was in a trance, the Bible says. And he got up and, and God said, Slay and eat. He said, No, sir. He said, I have never ate any unclean thing in my life. And God said, That what the Lord has made clean is clean herewith. And so he ate. And, and so I believe that's what happened here. And once again, that's just one man's belief on that, that we have that. And I, you know, and it's really close. It's a fine, <laughs> it, it's a fine line between the Baptist faith and message and the dictation theory. But I, I believe that it came to be because, y'all remember the uh, fundamental uh, movement we had about 15, 20 years ago in the Southern Baptist Convention? About 25 years ago, we had a very ultra-liberal movement to the left, and there arose a lot of questions, even in our seminaries, about the total inspiration and inerrance of the other Word of God. And in the year of 2000, we rewrote the Baptist faith and message to, so that we could get to that place. Now, how we got it doesn't deter from the fact that Southern Baptists as a whole believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. All right? It's just how we arrived at that inerrancy that's in a little bit of a difference there. And, and six in one half a dozen in the other to a degree. The key is, is that you believe that the book is the total inerrant Word of God. And I, I sometimes feel that, I remember when Bobby taught the Baptist faith message and we got to that particular critical issue there, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I personally, I'm not even going to go there. We'll just skip that. That's for another day in time. Let's move on here. The uniqueness of the Bible. Uh, the Scriptures were written by approximately 40 different men. They lived in several different countries and different times. And they wrote in three different languages. But the key is, and I want to go back to what Joey said, and, you know, there's a whole lot of different versions. But you know what? They all say the same thing. Amen. And that's the key, is that you read the book. Now, I've been reading this in all my life, and I'm going to continue to read it, but even though right now I'm, I'm reading the whole of translation in my daily Bible study, because I, I like to know all these different versions. But the key is, is to read the Bible. Now, I'm going to end this lecture here, because I see we're just about uh, out of time. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask some questions in the three remaining minutes that we have. <laughs> Anybody with a question? Mark. Doc, I'm not a Catholic and I don't understand everything that they believe, but some tell me that the Bible isn't complete because it doesn't contain the books of the Maccabees and all these other things that are out there. I don't know anything about that. But people say, say that. Is there any, I don't want to say any truth to that, but what's the What's the deal with these other books that are out there that are not contained in the Bible? The question is, is the Apocrypha, which in, it, you might have seen this in some of the Reformed versions of the Bible. You have the Old Testament, and then you have what they call the intertestamental books, and then you have the New Testament. Now, Southern Baptists, we refer to those intertestamental books as the Apocrypha, which means, Apocrypha means false, uh, uh, Apo means false, Apocrypha means writings, false writing. 
We believe that they're wrong. And we believe the Bible is incomplete. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation, if you have to, you take away, uh, then your part will be taken out of the book of heaven. We, we don't espouse to those books. And, and almost all conservative theologians, probably 99% of the, the conservative theologians from the 14th century to today, reject those books as being inspired. They're just, in, in fact, not only do you have, I think it's 17 books, I've I, been a long time since I studied on that, but to tell the truth, there was about 300 false writings. Now how these became a, as part of it, and, and they have false, one of them, I believe it's in Bell and the Dragon, it says that uh, Jesus saw a little bird with a broken wing, and He went over and He touched the wing, and He healed the bird, and the bird flew off. But the Bible says in John chapter 2 that He turned water into wine and this was His first miracle. So either John's wrong or the Apocrypha's wrong. And also in the Apocrypha there's this belief that Jesus traveled all over the world before He turned 30 years old. In fact, uh, there's some historical revenue that some man named Jesus was in India and in Pakistan and in those areas. But the Bible says He began His ministry at age 30 and it's all copied in the Word of God. So once again, we either have the books that are in the Bible are false or those books are false. Make sense to you? It does. All right. Anybody else? Uh, I want to say a word about your handout. Now we're going to have... Ben, where are you? Do you have, one, do you have mine? Yeah. We, it's not going to look like this, but everybody's going to get a full copy. It was my fault. I, I, I misunderstood some things and we got down to the end here. Our copier broke down on us. Joanne tried to work on it like wild. And we tried to get you books out. We're going to give you the full book. It's uh, about 75 pages. has all 12 lessons. And we'll have those for you next Sunday night. We'll actually have them out before then. But... Uh, uh, I, the buck stops here, amen. I was just, uh, you're dealing with an old man. Alright. Any work before we go? Man, thank you guys for coming. Amen. Let's eat some more donuts and coffee and stay up later, amen. <laughs> let's, let's close with prayer. Father, as we come again to the throne of grace, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you for these who love you, God. This is your people, Lord. And they love you and they love your word. Help us, the three of us, Father, share with you these, the things of God, Lord. We're going to thank you for it. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at the end of every class, we we'll, hopefully we'll get to about a ten-minute time there. Bring you questions, and we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to have some dialogue back and forth, okay? All right, God bless you.